Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I'll be your reader today. We have a long journey ahead of us today in the next 60 minutes. My goal is to cover the years between 1853 and 1985. So fasten your seatbelt because we have a big journey ahead of us and a fascinating one. I was listening last evening, let me start by telling you this, to a marvelous violin and piano sonata. Uh, I'm a classical music fan, but I also like country Western music, believe it or not. Last night I was listening to a violin sonata in A major. It was written in 1886 by César Franck, who was from Belgium. Uh, and it's an absolutely beautiful piece um, that is so soothing and so nurturing. It does have its uh, uh, little tiny wild moments, but in general, it's a beautiful piece of music, beautiful piece of music. And it has a most amazing story behind it. Um, the piece that I was listening to the musicians last evening, um, the recording was from 1930 actually, and 1930 is an important year in the story that I'm going to tell you today. Uh, and it was played four movements by uh, Yasha Heifetz uh, uh, on the violin with uh, Arthur Rubinstein on the piano. Um, and for those of you who do like classical music, um, I'm sure you recognize those great names in classical music. So we're going to start with that story. That's one th key thread through this journey that we're going to take together this morning. And the other thread that keeps intertwining with this beautiful sonata from 1886 is captured in a wonderful book by a man named Thomas Wolfe, who some of you may well know, uh, doesn't live in Maine any longer, but Thomas Wolfe and the Wolfe family are very instrumental in a key period in the arts uh, arena here in the Midcoast area. I'm trying not to give away the punchline, <laughs> so uh, because that's where we end up, and that's the important part of the story. So I'm going to intertwine it. The name of the book is The Nightingale Sonata, uh, and it does uh, trace us uh, all the way from Odessa on the Black Sea. Uh, in the northwest corner of the Black Sea, uh, all the way to Rockport Harbor. And all of that happens between the years 1853 and 1985. So travel with me uh, in order to accomplish my goal this morning. I am doing a bit of jumping, jumping around uh, to the high points. The book is absolutely fascinating in tracing so much detail of the history of this family. Um, and and I, uh, I just suggest reading it. The last great Russian book that I read was War and Peace. So I think this is equally as good. Although I will say that this book, The Nightingale Sonata, has 61 characters in it. Um, as compared to War and Peace that seemed to have over 200. Uh, it also makes mention in the book of nine different czars and tsaritsas over the time period covered. Um, so there's a lot going on um, and I'm going to try to keep that all straight for you. I want to start with the, fa uh, I want to start first though with a prelude here. We're going to start with the thread and go back and forth between the family history and the history of this sonata. So let me read the start of our story, 1853. The year was 1853. The Belgian musician César Franck began writing a sonata for violin and piano. After composing some of the music, he sent the work to the legendary pianist and composer Franz Liszt. 
But sometime after doing so, Frank abandoned the project. A few years later, he took up the idea of a violin sonata again. This time, he had a special incentive. He wanted to dedicate the work to Liszt's daughter, Cosima, who had recently married Hans von Bülow, Liszt's most talented pupil. Again, the project came to nothing. Whether it was Frank's inability to muster inspiration or his suspicion that the von Bülow's marriage was headed for disaster, he set the work aside. He was prescient. By 1865, Cosima had fallen in love with composer Richard Wagner and born his child. By that time, Frank had become completely disillusioned and disappointed with his attempts to write a violin sonata. That is the same year of another great disappointment that opens my family's story. To set the stage for the family story, we could go back uh, to uh, the earliest part with Rabbi Kotzman, but I think the most important place to start is Thomas Wolfe's great-grandparents. Uh, Thomas Wolfe's great-grandparents were Catherine, or Geitel, G-I-T-E-L, was her, her preferred name, and her husband, Misha Katzman. Now, the Katzmans uh, were very fortunate in having three children over time. We're now back way earlier than this 1853. Uh, they had three children, Anna Lubaschutz, Pierre Lubaschutz, and Leah Lubaschutz. Um, and the name Lubaschutz comes into the picture because uh, Catherine and Misha actually, I've made a terrible mistake, were brother and sister. And Catherine married Saul Lubaschutz. So the three children, Anna, Pierre, and Leah. Leah is the person we're focusing on in this story today, Leba Lubaschutz, who throughout history until her passing was one of the most famous violinists in the world. And I'll tell you more as we move on. Now, Leah Lubaschutz uh, was in a very long relationship with a gentleman named Onisim Goldovsky. Onisim Goldovsky. And together they had three children, Yuri Goldovsky, Boris Goldovsky, who some of you opera fans may well know, he was the voice of opera here in America for so many years. Uh, so Boris Goldovsky is a name that some of you will recognize. And Irene Godovsky. Now, Irene Godovsky gave birth to two sons. Um, note in our story, uh, and that is Thomas and Andrew Wolf. Irene married Walter Billy Wolf and had these two boys as part of their family. Uh, and this is the story we're going to get down to. Thomas Wolf wrote the book as a great salute to his grandmother, particularly, but to his entire family. Uh, with such incredible detail, which I said earlier. Uh, Andrew Wolf, or Andy, uh, will end our story uh, in 1985, uh, but the two brothers together uh, made great, great waves in the world of music, as did their grandmother. So the grandmother, Leah Lubuschutz, is the person we're going to focus on. So hold all of that. I'm sure if I gave you a quiz at the moment, you would get that all perfectly right and not make the first mistake that I made about brother and sister. Now to set our scene uh, back at the beginning, uh, sounds like the Bible to begin at the beginning. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about Odessa. Odessa, uh, as I mentioned, is on the Black Sea in the Northwest uh, corner of the Black Sea. 
Uh, and Odessa uh, at the time of the great grandparents' marriage, uh, Jews accounted for one third of the city's population. Odessa was part of the pale, P-A-L-E, the pale of settlement, it was called, a strip of land running from Poland and Lithuania to the Black Sea. In 1791, Catherine the Great had declared that Russian Jews had to live within the borders of the Pale, trapping them in this vast impoverished territory on the periphery of the empire. Most of the Pale was composed of half starving rural settlements or shetels and a handful of Polish, Lithuanian and Ukrainian cities long past their prime. By creating the pale, Catherine not only helped solve what many Russians considered the Jewish problem, but in the South, at least, it helped populate sparsely occupied territories and establish commercial control over areas that had been annexed from the Ottoman Empire. But Odessa was a growing metropolis, offering employment as well as the chance for Jews to meld unnoticed into the city's multicultural social life. Jews flocked to the city from elsewhere in the Pale, and some even prospered. At the peak of their success, Jewish entrepreneurs held about half of the city's trading and manufacturing licenses, and they dominated the business of exporting Russian grains to Europe. An Odessa-based Jewish firm, Ravinowich and Company, was the first Russian company to trade with China. Restrictions for Jewish employment in Russia were relaxed in Odessa, and Jews became doctors, pharmacists, lawyers, bankers, innkeepers, and bakers. The imperial government permitted the first Russian Jewish school to open in Odessa in 1826, and the first Jewish newspaper was published there in 1860. But Leah Lubowitz, our heroine today, but Leah's memories and a handful of success stories belied a more complex reality for most Odessan Jews. One third of the city's Jewish families were poor enough to need food assistance on the holy days and one fifth were destitute. Poverty and overcrowding worsened as Jews were expelled from Moscow, St. Petersburg and rural Ukraine and fled to the relative safety of Odessa. Saul and Geitel, with their tiny apartment and struggling piano business, were considered solidly middle class by the standards of Jewish Odessa. Like all Russian Jews, the Lubashutses were considered aliens under Russian law, and they enjoyed privileges bestowed by the Tsar rather than rights. These privileges were defined by a thicket of decrees, regulations, instructions, clarifications, orders, and amendments. An 1889 compilation of the rules pertaining to Jews in Russia ran to 290 pages. Jews were not allowed to own land and they were barred from the military officer corps, the civil service, academia, and the judiciary. They paid special taxes on kosher meat, yamukas, Sabbath candles, rental income, and business profits. Even worse, the Jews of Odessa were periodically targeted by mob violence. The term pogrom originated in Odessa, where Jews were attacked by Greeks in 1821 and 1859, and by Russians in 1871. The most terrifying pogrom of the 19th century occurred in 1881, the year of Geidel's marriage to Saul. For weeks, rumors circulated that Jews had been behind the assassination of Tsar Alexander II of St. Petersburg. Well aware of the tensions around them, Jews tried to stay behind closed doors, but it was impossible to avoid work, shopping, and attending services. 
Eventually, armed gangs appeared, attracting growing mobs as they roamed the streets searching for Jews, including women, children, and the elderly. The mobs were ruthless and often murderous. If they couldn't find Jews to assault, they burned and ransacked Jewish homes and businesses. As usual with Russian pogroms, the police either stood by or joined the attackers, leaving Jews without any protection at all. In an eerie foreshadowing of 20th century Europe, Odessa in the spring of 1881 turned overnight from a center of culture, tolerance, and globalism into a bloodbath for the Jews. It was probably at this point that Geitel and Saul found, vowed to do whatever was necessary to take the children of their union out of the pale of settlement. So this sets our stage as we progress forward with the children. Let us weave in the story now of the sonata again, so we keep track of progress there. The period here is 1885, just following what I just read to you. Cesar Frank returned to the sonata for violin and piano in 1885. Inspiration came immediately this time, and the work took only a few weeks to complete. Frank dedicated it to one of the world's great violinists, his fellow countryman, Eugène Isai. The timing was perfect as the Sonata was ready for Isai to play on his wedding day, September 26, 1886. Legend has it that rather than prepare for the wedding in a more conventional way, the violinist spent considerable time rehearsing the difficult piece with one of the wedding guests, a pianist. The reaction of the bride, Louise Bordeaux de Coutray, can only be imagined. Three months later, the two musicians gave their first public performance of the sonata as the finale of a long afternoon program. By the time they were ready to perform it, the hall was so dark that the two performers had to play it from memory. That did not restrain the crowd. Like so many audiences in ensuing years, they were wildly enthusiastic. Isaye immediately added César Franck's sonata to his repertoire and played it in recitals all over the world. It was during one of Isaye's tours of Russia that Onisim Goldovsky and later, turn my page properly here, later members of the Lubaschutz family heard the work for the first time. It would change their lives. The first movement of the sonata has been called gentle and sweetly reflective. According to Isaye, in his letter to the composer, it is one long caress, a gentle awakening on a summer morning. It is a miracle. Just want to repeat the names a moment because I've given you several names so far. The composer again, César Franck, his favorite friend, one of the world's greatest violinists and very important to the rest of this story uh, is Eugène Isaye, another Belgian. Uh, and as I mentioned toward the end, it was not until later that the Goldovskis and later even members of the Lubaschutz family heard the work for the first time. It would change their life. We left at 1885 and back to our first thread, our other thread, the family thread. Catherine and Saul Lubaschutz's miracle took shape on February 10, 1885 with the birth of a daughter 
whom they named Leah, my grandmother. Saul was especially ecstatic. By the time Leah was two, the same year my grandfather, Onesim, graduated from Moscow University, Saul decided without any real evidence that Leah was the musical prodigy he had hoped for. Saul and Geidel had not forgotten the 1881 pogrom and their vow to leave. Leah could make their name famous throughout Russia and provide a way out of the pale of settlement. Geidel shared Saul's dream, though more practically, she made sure Leah kept Saul distracted and out of the way of the family's piano business. There was only one way that Saul and Geidel's dream of getting beyond the pale to a better place could be realistic. Jews who had accomplished this feat had done so through great wealth or extraordinary talent. And there was no way a piano business was going to lead them to sufficient riches to impress the authorities. Thus, it was important for Saul and Geidel to learn whether Leah had musical talent as quickly as possible, and if so, figure out how to nurture it. A slight pause, the pronunciation is Leah. I've made that second error today, Leah. As soon as she could stand on her own two feet, Leah was taught by Saul to hold herself erect, her head tilted slightly up with pride, and to always look her best in every way. Her remarkable deportment and appearance were qualities she retained for the rest of her life. At the same time, she learned to hold a tiny violin and bow, and by the time she turned four, and Saul was ready to teach her to play the instrument, Leah's posture and hand positions were well established. She made rapid progress within months, but Saul was relentless. Mastering the music was not enough. And if Leah was to succeed, she had to play before audiences so that performing became came natural. Neighbors were summoned to listen. By the time Leah started school at age five, she had enough repertoire to fill a dutifully memorized little piece after little piece. Gentle Saul, whom everyone loved, was always unrecognizable as a taskmaster, although my grandmother insists he always criticized constructively. The condition under which Leah practiced was almost unimaginable. The family lived in two rooms with windows that opened onto a dank courtyard. As Leah described it 50 years later, the sun never penetrated and the rooms were always gloomy and damp. During the winter, we had to use a lamp from early in the morning until it was time to retire. The only source of heat was from a little stove, which was used with great economy. Rising at six, I quickly dressed, ate a hasty breakfast, and then practiced, although my hands were nearly frozen. After her early practice and breakfast, she left the cold house for the relative warmth of the outside, even on cold days, outside seemed warmer. She went on to school, came home, practiced two more hours, had a one course dinner, did her schoolwork, practiced another hour, and finally went to bed. That was the routine day after day. The one exception was Friday. On that day, Geidel scrubbed the house, polished the silver candlesticks, cooked a delicious meal, spread the table with a beautiful white cloth and recited prayers along with Saul before continue consuming chicken, piroshki, meat-filled buns, gefilte fish and horseradish and sweet pastries. Even more special was the annual seder, or Passover meal, at which Geitel's father, the rabbi, presided and had other family members crowded into their tiny apartment. Leah's first concert, as her parents insisted on calling it, was preceded by countless performances in front of visitors. By the time she appeared before her school audi audience, she was more excited about the new ribbon in her hair than she was nervous about the performance. 
She played every piece she had ever learned as people insisted on encores. From that moment on, she decided that she loved to perform. Never again, though, would performing be so easy and enjoyable. The more she learned and the more she mastered her instrument, the harder it became. Meanwhile, Saul believed that another important component of Leia's training was exposure to great musicians who made their way to Odessa. No matter the cost, Saul either purchased a ticket and held Leia on his lap or stood in the back of the hall holding her high enough to see. According to Leia's memoir, when the world famous Pablo de Sarasate came to town sometime in the early 1890s, Saul was particularly excited. This man, he told Leia, was considered among the greatest violinists of all times. After the concert, Saul quizzed Leia about what she had heard. Trying to impress her father, she told him that she had heard a false F sharp in the performance of one of Sarasate's own compositions and that she was surprised the master could play even one note out of tune. Saul was enraged. He had expected her to admire and study the divine playing of the great man, not to look for wrong notes. This lesson was not lost on the young child and for the rest of her life, Leia would admire what was good about performances avoiding negative criticism. Except with her own students, when critiquing was part of her job, she wanted to be positive. I was always amazed as I was growing up by my grandmother's ability to find something to praise, even at concerts that weren't all that great. When a particular performance was awful, I wondered what she could possibly say. She would throw her arms around the dejected performer and in remark in an excited voice, darling, how you played. <laughs> it was probably during one of Eugene Yeseyev's uh, concert tours of Russia that Leia and her father heard him play Frank's violin and piano sonata. In later life, in later life, she never said when she first heard it, and now I regret, regret that I never asked her. What is certain is that before she was 13, she was not only familiar with the piece, but also determined both to learn it and someday study it with Isai. When my grandmother reached the age of eight, Saul realized she was, he was out of his depth. Leia required both a better teacher and an environment where she would be seen and heard by important people who could help her advance in the fiercely competitive music world. Saul and Geidel were hardly the only parents who claimed they had a wunder kind on their hands. Countless Jewish families believed that their children were at least as talented as Leia. The joke in Odessa was, how do you know which of your neighbor's children will become a successful mathematician? Answer, the one not carrying the violin case. In their attempt to find a great teacher and mentor, the family had extraordinarily good luck. Emil Minarski was teaching at the Odessa Conservatory. Minarski had studied under Leopold Auer, the greatest living violin pedagogue in Russia. Leia played for Minarski and immediately he arranged for a scholarship so that she could study with him. The lessons took place every Sunday in his private home, the likes of which Leia had never even dreamed. The Minarski seemed extravagantly rich. Here Leia not only learned the violin but became fluent in French the language of the household. Minarski's wife and mother both took a shine to the eight-year-old and wanted to give her the polish she would need to complement her violin playing. Special clothes were purchased for these occasions, including Leia's first pair of patent leather shoes. On Sunday mornings at the Lubeschutz home, Water was boiled for Leah's bath and her mother dressed her carefully and thoroughly brushed her hair. 
for poor Jews, this connection was too important to be careless. Thus began the first of Leah's many transformations from a poor Jewish girl to an elegant and refined woman. At the Melnarskis, she not only studied how to play the violin, she began to acquire the manners, the demeanor, and the sophistication of the wealthy. The decision to send Leah to Moscow so that she could become a professional musician could not have come at a better time in at least one respect. A golden age had arrived in Russian classical music and music making. In the 18th and 19th centuries, what we today refer to as classical music has been produced primarily, <coughs> excuse me, in Western European capitals. Such places, Vienna, Paris, Venice, Salzburg, London, Leipzig, not only had been home to great composers, but also great performers. From the time of Peter the Great, 1672 to 1725, European culture in general and European music in particular were considered part of civilized society in Russia. But Russian music was felt to be the province of the church and of folk music traditions. This view began to change in the 19th century when composers such as Mikhail Glinka, Alexander Borodin, Modest Mussorgsky, and Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, and a number of others developed a Russian school of composition. While many of the musical forms they employed were those of their European counterparts, a new national style incorporated material that was distinctly Russian. The giant among these composers was Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, who lived from 1840 to 1893, whose works became immensely popular, not only in Russia, but throughout the world. As with composers, so too with instrumentalists. While Western European players still overwhelmingly dominated the classical music scene in the first half of the 19th century, the formation of the St. Petersburg Conservatory in 1862 and the Moscow Conservatory in 1866 marked the development of two important Russian pedagogical centers, which in time developed their own highly acclaimed style of teaching and playing. Leia's arrival at the Moscow Conservatory at the turn of the century was well-timed since it was a moment when Russian performers were becoming international stars and their country's repertoire was part of their attraction. But if Leia's arrival in Moscow was fortuitous in certain respects, she still had a major handicap to overcome. She was a woman and very simply classical music was a male dominated world. There was a long standing French tradition promoted in painting and literature of viewing women in the arts, ballerinas, music hall performers and the like as available to men for something more than the performance. Rich men could become patrons of such women, which often translated into setting them up in apartments, bestowing clothing and other finery, and taking sexual favors in exchange. For many of these women, the ultimate goal was marriage. Thus, for Leia to succeed as a great artist, she had not only to become a great player, but also overcome these misogynistic attitudes. Leia was fortunate to enter Moscow Conservatory in a golden age of Russian music. Let us move forward from there to keep going with the wonderful story of Leia here. 
By the time she got to the Moscow Conservatory, many of the teachers thought she was among the most amazing talents they had ever come across. Safanov, the director, arranged for a loan of one of the conservatory's finest violins, a 16th century Italian instrument made in Cremona by a member of the Amate family. Leah was excused from everything except her violin study, including basic subjects in music considered essential to an artist's development. Once again, Leia went through a transformation, this time from an eager and anxious conservatory student to a spoiled and arrogant one. Leia was favored with the best solo and orchestral performance opportunities. She was immediately assigned the concertmaster principal violin position of the conservatory orchestra, even though other students were very much more experienced and possibly just as gifted. As a result, Leia never learned to be an orchestral sectional player. When the Moscow Conservatory Orchestra traveled to St. Petersburg in 1902 for a major event, Leia was favored once again. The occasion was the unveiling of a statue of Anton Rubinstein, the late founder of the St. Petersburg Conservatory, and she and other students from Moscow were joined in concert by the St. Petersburg Conservatory Orchestra. My grandmother took the concert master chair, even though most considered the players in the other orchestra superior. Indeed, Ephraim Zimbalist, the St. Petersburg Conservatory concert master at the time, who years later became Leia's boss at the Conservatory Institute of Music in the United States, remember that, and someone whom I would come to regard as a god of violin playing was relegated to the fourth stand, according to Leia's recollections. Later in my grandmother's memoir, she was uncompromisingly honest about how damaging all this was. I now realize how wrong everything was concerning me. My professors overrated my talent. The director did the same thing. If a well-known artist came to Moscow, I was the one chosen to play for him. When the Moscow orchestra went on tour, I was the soloist with them. Is there any wonder that all this attention from my professor and the director turned my head? I considered myself a very important person and would not listen to the critical remarks of my pupil colleagues. The more they disliked, the more I pleased myself. And I was sure I was right. I blush now when I remember how atrociously I became. The more I think about it, the more I have to admit that if I had been trained as a normal child, and if I had been told again and again that there was nothing to be so important about, if they had told me that the greater an artist is, the more modest he is, if they had told me to compare myself to someone who knew more, they would not have made the monster they did. This was a lesson drilled into my brother and me by my grandmother as we embarked on our own adventures on music years later. But there was a caveat. One should not swagger and boast and behave like a superstar when one has quite ordinary. That we were permitted, that we were not permitted to do. But it was equally wrong to hide under a rock, as Leia succinctly put it, and be inappropriately modest and shy. The music world was and is incredibly competitive and claiming one's place in it is necessary to advance. Being confident and outgoing was not the same as being a blowhard and a braggart, and it did not take us long to understand the difference. Of course, growing up in the mid 20th century America, our challenges were very different from Leia's. We did not have to overcome virulent anti-Semitism, just as important, we were boys. Leia was one of the only women at the conservatory. Her teachers were all men, and were most of the other students. 
As an attractive female, there was always the stigma of her sex and later the innuendo that Leia was getting special treatment in exchange for sexual favors. All of this must have heightened her sense of otherness and isolation. Claiming and building on her talent would be her only visible way forward. This strategy paid dividends for her in three important ways. First, People gradually stopped belittling her talent because she was female. Quite simply, she was considered the best student in her class, period. The second benefit was that composers began to take an interest in her and to write music for her. One of these was Reinhold Glier, who was just beginning a long and successful career in 1902 when he heard Leah play for the first time. As the composer recalled afterwards, her playing so mesmerized him that he started to dream about her. And in one of the dreams, the melody for his romance, Opus 3, came to him. He immediately wrote it down and asked Leia if he could dedicate it to her and have her play its premiere in 1903. The work was subsequently issued by the imperial music publisher, Mr. Fan Petrovich Baliev, and became a standard not only in her repertoire, but in that of almost every Russian and Soviet violinist for the next hundred years. Leia's third advantage of unabashedly claiming her talent was that when the world famous Belgian violinist, Eugène Issey, came to Moscow to perform, it was Leia who was chosen to play for him when he visited the conservatory. Like many touring virtuosos, he also was searching out promising students. Yisei was sufficiently impressed when he heard Leia to invite her to his Belgian summer retreat for study after she graduated. Leia was excited about the possibility. She had long been determined to study the César Franck Sonata with Isaye. She knew that her tradition-bound professors at the conservatory would not consider adding this piece to her repertoire, but Leia loved what she had heard and decided to try to learn the piece in the event she ever did travel to Belgium. At Leia's special treatment grew, her special students were filled with envy, and one of the students suggested the incredibly daring scheme of disrupting her graduation recital. Everyone understood the importance of this concert, uh, which was to take place on May 13, 1903, at age 18. At these events, a decision would be made as to whether any student deserved to be awarded a coveted gold medal, a rare honor memorialized by the awardee's name being engraved in gold leaf on a predominantly displayed marble plaque outside the concert hall. In my grandmother's year, five violin students competed, and such was the anticipation of Leia's performance and director Savanov's optimism about her success, that the director arranged for Geidel to come from Odessa to hear the program. Saul, the parent most responsible for Leia's musical success, was left in Odessa to tend to the other children. My grandmother at this point was 18 years old. Like the other older candidates, she was to play a full program carefully chosen by her teachers, including an unaccompanied work, the Bach Patita, containing the devilishly difficult Chaconne movement. A concerto, the brilliant D major concerto of Niccolo Paganini, and various shorter show pieces. It was her final concert on her beloved Amati violin, which had uh, to be returned to the school, and she wanted the violin to remember her fondly. The special form of attachment between player and instrument is not uncommon. People say that every player, especially a great one, leaves his or her personality on a string instrument, and that the very cell structure of the word changes as a result. True or not, my grandmother spent her life playing on some of the greatest instruments ever made. 
and she regarded them as members of her family with distinct personalities, character traits, and moods. They had to be treated with the feeling that was to be reciprocated and beauty created. Before this important performance, a few students bribed the pianist for Leia's graduation recital, convincing him to start the open of the Paganini concerto a half step higher than it was written so that when Leia entered with her solo part in the correct key, it would sound as though she had made a mistake, possibly throwing off her concentration for the rest of her performance. Fortunately, like her sister, Leia had perfect pitch and knew the key was wrong as soon as the pianist played the first notes. She turned and said in a loud voice that everyone in the crowded hall could hear, now please play it in D major as it is written. This only added to her triumph. When she was finished, the audience broke into a sustained ovation, much to the irritation of Savanov, since at that time applause was not permitted at these events. After a long day of recitals, the professors announced the decision. Yes, a gold medal would be given to a violinist this year, and it would go to Leia Lubaschutz. My grandmother's triumph was complete. Her name would be enshrined in gold on the marble plaque. Leia also received a magnificent certificate embossed with gold leaf that she would somehow manage to bring out of Russia all the way to America, where I now preserve it among other family treasures. It's a great section of a story there. Let's go back to the Sonata for a moment. We've now established the connection between Leia and Issae, to whom it was dedicated, you remember, and who played it in his own repertoire for 40 years. During his lifetime, Cesar Frank never enjoyed the acclaim that came to Yasea, who performed his sonata for violin and piano. After the 1886 premiere, it took about a decade for the sonata to be widely known and admired. By that time, Frank had been dead for five years. Issae, on the other hand, became well known for the work and kept it in his repertoire for four decades. In time, other performers took up the piece and it became one of the most popular sonatas for violin and piano ever written. Issae taught the piece to my grandmother. Leia taught it to her brother, my great uncle Pierre. Pierre taught it to Leia's son, my uncle Boris. On and on, it moved through the family, always resurfacing at important times. The second movement is a tempestuous celebration of life. It begins with fast finger work on the piano with the main theme passing rapidly from one hand to the other. The violin enters aggressively and the two are off on a chase. At times they slow down, reveling in moments of calm, reflective beauty but these are brief and soon overwhelmed by action, excitement and events happening at a pace and intensity it's hard to keep up with. I will tell you, wrote Yesayev to the composer, it is simply splendid. Now let us move on with our story here. <clears throat> Returning to Moscow, Leia took a room. I know we have to say something first here. Leia returned home to Odessa. Yiseyev invited her to come to be his student, as you remember. And one of the great things about that invitation was the promise that he would teach her to master the sonata. Uh, which he did do. She did study under him uh, and did learn the sonata, as was mentioned earlier. 
And then she returned to Odessa and there spent the summer of 1903. Before leaving uh, Moscow, she thanked Isayev uh, that she might one day take up the invitation that her idol had given her to learn more pieces other than the famous Sonata and to come to Belgium for advanced study. Among other incentives was her desire to continue to perfect César Franck's Sonata with the master for whom it had been written. Returning to Moscow in the fall, Leah took a room in a boarding house that catered to young musicians. So we now have her back in Moscow. Leia's visit to Isaye in summer of 1904, her first trip to Belgium, took her farther west than she had ever been. Isaye's summer retreat hosted 25 young violinists. Among them, Leia was the youngest. Several were wealthy Americans playing ex exorbitant fees to study with the master. Madame Yeseyev, the former Louise Bordeaux de Coutray, was the woman at whose marriage ceremony the César Franck Sonato had been played for the first time by her husband-to-be. By now, the marriage had reached the stage where husband and wife had very different views about many things, including which students should receive priority treatment. Isaye warned, uh, wanted to teach the talented ones. His wife wanted to be sure to give performance and preference to the rich ones, according to Leia. It was generally the latter view that prevailed, for it was Madame Yaseyev who arranged the schedule and Leia studied with the master. Life became complicated, however. Leah was wedged between two quarreling adults. Each time received, she received special attention from Isaiah, the other pupils, especially the wealthy Americans, whom Isaiah took little interest in, made her life miserable, a replay of her years at the conservatory. But the connection to the master made up for everything. Amazingly, when Leah played a concerto or a sonata, Isaiah could simulate an entire orchestral or piano accompaniment on his violin. As she put it in her memoir, I was overwhelmed by the way Issae played and how he could accompany a piece on the violin. Each lesson, each time I saw him when he used to call a few of us into play chamber music or when everybody came for a party, he was always a privilege to be associated with him. His personality was so striking that I don't know anyone who can compare with him. He was like a lion with the heart of a lamb. It is hard to say whether he was too affectionate with Leia. Madame Essaye certainly thought so. In the older woman's defense, she often protected her husband from the consequences of his instinctive generosity and willingness to engage with anyone. After the fall of the Soviet Union, photographs of my grandmother and her sister as young women finally found their way to the United States. As we move along, we're going to find out more of that story. In the tumultuous events of 1905, complicated everything. When revolution broke in St. Petersburg, triggering strikes, riots, army mutinies, peasants uprising and pogroms against the country, Onesim and Rachel needed to make a decision about what to do. The violence persisted for months. By fall, Moscow was besieged with street violence and in October, the battle was literally on their doorstep. The 1905 revolution began in January when troops guarding the Tsar's Winter Palace in St. Petersburg fired on a crowd of unarmed protesters. Known as Bloody Sunday, the massacre unleashed a wave of strikes and riots across the country. 
That same month, Moscow's deeply conservative metropolitan, the title for Archbishop of the Orthodox Church in the city, wrote an epistle to all believers. The epistle called upon Orthodox faithful to repudiate the revolutionary movement and assert their loyalty to the Tsar, the church, and the Russian nation. In thinly veiled language, Metropolitan Vladimir blamed Russia's economic ills on Jews and atheist intellectuals. The epistle was read and in Moscow's churches on Sunday, uh, October 17. On that day, Onosim and his assistant were relaxing in the office discussing political events. A few moments later, two young brothers who spoke out against the priests were chased into the street. Fortunately, Leia was planning to leave the country temporarily. Vasily Zafanov, Leia's mentor from the conservatory, had once again been kind and invited her to come to Paris and with him when he guest orchestrated and conducted the La Maru Orchestra in a Sunday matinee on December 17, 1905 at the Nouveau Théâtre at 15 Rue Blanche. Leo would serve as a soloist in the Beethoven Violin Concerto. So now we have Leia in Paris getting closer. <laughs> Once home, whoops, let's not skip here. Home once again in Moscow, after Paris, life began to settle down to something approaching normality. One September, between 1910 and 1913, as we move our story along, Accounts of the exact date vary. Leah had a second opportunity to study with her idol, Eugène Issaye. Now, this is very good news. Let's bring the link back about the sonata. At some point in its history, a great piece of music takes on a life of its own. Neither the composer who gave birth to it, nor the person for whom it was written, can do more than claim their role in its history. For Eugène Issaye and the sonata, the A major for violin and piano by César Franck, this moment was near. By 1921, Issaye was 63. He had been playing the violin since age five. Physical ailments were beginning to trouble him as they do many violinists in their 60s. Issaye decided to accept an offer to become conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, a position with less strenuous than that of a touring violin soloist. There he became increasingly close to Jeanette Dissin, a violinist, 44 years his junior, whom he married two years later. She cared for him during the 10 years until his death. Afterward, she would fight to keep his legacy alive. The third movement of the Frank Sonata is a fantasia or fantasy, a musical form that invites improvisation. Issaye found it to be profound. In his letter to the composer, he wrote, the third movement, that sentimental declamation is the most gripping part of the work. There are no set rules for a fantasy. It is a form in which classical components, composers feel they can operate more freely. For his part, Frank decides to go on a musical journey of exploration. The intensity of the second movement is spent. The tempo is more subdued and moderate. It is time to take stock, explore the melodic material, and figure out where it wants to go. 1921. If there was one thing Leia didn't know in 1921 after arriving in Berlin and in the months forward, afterward, it was where she wanted to go. There seemed to be no good alternatives. 
Returning to the family in Russia was out of the question. Western Europe was in post-war turmoil. The United States was too far away. And aside from her brief trip there in 1907, it was unknown territory. 1931, if anything felt triumphant to Leah in 1931, it was that she had finally settled in America with her family. Her talent, hard work, and sheer grit had paid off. But we skip a significant year in Leah's life, and that's the year of 1930. Now, the reason that 1930 is so crucial is because what brought her to America, or should I say what kept her in America, was this story from the Curtis Institute of Music. My grandmother, Leah Lubavitz, joined the violin faculty of the Curtis Institute of Music in 1928. Over the next quarter century, she taught roughly 150 students, many of whom won jobs in major orchestras, including six in the Philadelphia Orchestra. Two of Leo's students became concert masters, Raphael Druyan with orchestras in Dallas, Minnesota, Cleveland, and New York, and Henry Seigel with the Seattle Symphony. Leia also had success with female students, including one, Ethel Stark, who became famous as the conductor and longtime conductor of the orchestra made up entirely of women. 1928, the Curtis Institute of Music, there's a connection, isn't there? And that connection brings us to 1930. And the Curtis Institute of Music explored other directions in that period. And before me is a wonderful picture from 1930, I wish I could show you, uh, which has this statement. It's a, it's a group of five musicians in 1930, Curtis's founder, Mary Louise Curtis Bach, obtained a number of homes lining the shore of Rockport and Camden, Maine, for summer studies by faculty and students. Faculty members, Leia Lubaschutz, <laughs> Felix Salmon, Dr. Louis Bailey, and Max Adenoff were among those who summered in Rockport in the 1930s. Shown here during that first summer are violin faculty members, Leah Lubrishit seated and her students at the Mary Leah Cottage and they list the students. So we now have a connection to Rockport via the Curtis Institute uh, in 1928. We now come to Rockport. And those of you who know your way around Rockport, it's very um, easy to see a beautiful monument that is in Rockport to Mary, uh, Mary Leia Park. This park is dedicated to the memory of Lieber Lubersch 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 uh 1885 to 1965. Now, we go from there to another story that links everything together. Believe me, I'll pull all these strings together in the end. Uh, and that is Marcel Proust. <laughs> Who would have thought in his 3,458 pages, uh, we would find a little section here about the very sonata that we've been talking about. And let me read this to you from Marcel Proust, written in 1913. Swan heard the lovely dialogue between the piano and violin at the beginning of the last movement. First, the solitary piano lamenting, like a bird abandoned, abandoned by its companion. Then the violin listening and replying as from a neighboring tree. It was as though they were at the beginning of the universe as though there were only those two remaining in the world 
or rather in a world closed to all the rest and constructed by a creator such that there would forever be only those two, the world of this sonata. Brilliant. Eugène Essay died in 1931, but the career of this violinist to whom César Franck had dedicated his sonata for violin and piano had been effectively over for some time. Illness had overtaken him and his last years were increasingly difficult. Like so many European musicians, he found success in America, but by the time he died, the sonata he had pre premiered and championed was more famous than he. It was not only famous musicians who praised its greatness and beauty. The celebrated French writer, Marcel Proust, paid tribute it to one of his novels, which I've just read to you. People who had never heard of Eugène Issey debated which performer's interpretation of the sonata was best. Violinists discussed arcane matters, such as whether a fingered slide at the beginning of the third movement should be repeated in a similar section at the end, and how expressive to make a particular pizzicato, plucked string. These questions were more important than they might appear. The sonata was now so well known that anyone could have an opinion on any detail and the advent of radio and recordings made it possible to scrutinize individual performers and compare one artist's interpretations to another. The final movement of the Frank Sonata was the device of a canon, a musical from which one instrument repeats a melody exactly as the other instrument has played in just a few moments earlier. The melody of the canon is based upon the single great thematic idea that recurs in all prior movements, transformed in each to reflect a different musical character. So I want to go back and bring it together. If anything felt triumphant to Leia in 1931, I read this to you before, it was that she had finally settled in, her Mar in America with her family. Her talent, hard work and sheer grit had paid off. We're going to move ahead to two people that I mentioned very early in my reading today. And that is uh, the wonderful grandsons of Leia Lubeschutz. And it is, of course, one of the grandsons, Thomas Wolfe, who became, has become very famous as a flautist and now as an author of this brilliant book. And his brother, uh, who carries on very much the tradition of Leia Lubeschutz. And so I'm going to jump from 1931 and I'm going to bring us closer to the end of our story, which as you know, from what I told you a moment ago with the beautiful plaque in Rockport by the Opera House, uh, does involve Rockport. We're going to start though in 1960. Uh, and I'm going to read you just one final thing about the Sonata. 1965 to 2018, uh, just as with every human life, every great piece of music must end. In examining the manuscript of César Franck's violin sonata, one finds his signature not on the first page, but on the last. It is as if he is saying, this is the end of the music. It is all I can offer. In addition to the signature, that last great page bears his dedication to Eugène Isaye. It was like a singular message from the composer, to you I entrust the work, go forth and give it continued life. But by 1965, Isaye was dead and his pupil who had given it continued life Leia Lubeschutz, who had also championed the sonata and played it throughout the world, was also dead. Soon Leia's sister, who had transcribed the work for cello and played it throughout Soviet Russia, would die, as would her brother Pierre, 
and her son Boris, both of whom had played the sonata with her and continued to keep it alive. Would this be the end of the family's treasured musical legacy? Leah had struggled mightily to be sure that the sonata would live within the bosom of her family, that it would continue to provide inspiration, jubilation, solace, and triumph. She had taught the sonata to a grandchild. And during her life, he had performed it and she had been satisfied. Though she would not live to see it, the day would come when he too would triumph with the great sonata. And let me now bring you to the final chapter of this brilliant story starting so long ago in 1853. After Leia's death, both my brother Andy and I were adrift. His years at the Curtis Institute of Music had not been happy ones, and his confidence had become even more fragile. His teacher, Rudolf Serkin, had been highly critical of Andy's playing, and Andy suspected that Serkin would never have accepted him as a student without Leia's intervention. In retrospect, Andy's experience was not unlike Leia's with Joseph Joachim when the great violinist had decided not to take her on as a student. Trained as a distinctly Roman, a Russian, Russian tradition, which stressed the beauty of sound above all else, her playing and Andy's was not compatible with the more Germanic approach of these two musical giants. But even if someone had explained this to Andy at the time, it would have done little to console him. He was miserable and his confidence was further eroded by the fact that without Leah's door opening abilities, his concertizing opportunities diminished. In my own case, by the time Leah died, I was convinced that I would not pursue a career as a flautist. I had had the best of teachers thanks to Leah and the family William Kincaid, principal flute at the Philadelphia Orchestra, and the legendary Frenchman Marcel Moise. But neither was particularly impressed with my playing, and in Moise's case, he could be downright cruel about it. I struggled to figure out what else to do. I toyed with the idea of medical school after spending many hours in hospitals with Leia, but it was clear I was even more unsuited for that as a career choice. The one good thing about our respective situations was that Andy and I could complain to one another and we did it on a daily basis. One of the few musical bright spots for us was a summer chamber music series that we had organized as teenagers in Rockport in 1960 and called Bay Chamber Concerts, we still love to this day. Though the Curtis Institute had officially closed down its summer music colony in Maine, many of its teachers continued to come there during the summer months and bring students. Curtis often paid the cost for lessons and housing. With so many talented youngsters around, Andy and I got the idea that we would start a concert series. The main problem was money. And the obvious patron was Mary Curtis Bach Zimbalist. She continued to spend the summer on the magnificent Curtis family estate in Rockport. The young students were from around the world, all loved the idea of playing concerts and getting Mrs. Zimbalist to pay for them. So, but no one was brave enough to actually meet with her and ask for the money. So I, the youngest at age 15, volunteered. Leia had set up the meeting and my father had driven me over and left me at the end of the long driveway. I didn't want anyone to notice that I was too young to drive. When I was somehow successful at securing a nice contribution, undoubtedly thanks to being Leia's grandson, I was anointed as the next Saul Hurok and appointed manager by acclamation. 
I was a lucky break for me. It was clear that no one would have wanted a flautist as part of the artistic core of serious chamber music players, especially one whose talents did not measure up to the high standards set by Curtis whiz kids. But if they wanted me to do all the administrative and fundraising tasks, that would have to let me play. After Leia's death, Rockport continued to have very special associations for us. And we'd like to spend as much time there as possible. Soon after she died, a new park was created in Leia's memory next to the Opera House, where we played our concerts and was named Mary Leia Park. It seemed as though everyone in town had known and loved Leia, and this affection rubbed off on us. Nevertheless, as enjoyable as these weeks of music making were, Bay Chambers concerts did not constitute a career. Life on the road with a great musician like Isaac Stern, who had discovered my brother, was very satisfying for him. And he was playing with under wonderful musicians like Leonard Rose when he was free and running the summer festival in Rockport, which he adored. He did learn to be careful not to imitate Stern's opulent lifestyle on the road. Andy was earning good fees, but they were roughly 5% of Stern's earning, which were astronomical uh, before, uh, because of being a superstar. On one occasion, as they planned their first concert together at London's Royal Festival Hall in December of 1981, Stern told Andy they would be staying at Claridge's, the luxury hotel, and that Andy should save up his laundry and dry cleaning because it was done so well there. On arrival after several weeks on the road, Andy turned over virtually everything he was traveling with. Sure enough, it arrived back beautifully packaged with fresh pressed flowers between the layers. He was delighted until he received his bill. It made quite a dent in his London concert fee. Back in the United States, the two musicians, my brother and Isaac Stern, played more and more of the most important venues, ultimately preparing for their first Carnegie Hall concert together where my grandmother had played. When the night finally came on January 12, 1983, Andy was strangely calm. I was the one who was so nervous. An ad in the New York Times had sold out written across it. That was serious business. Are you going to play the Frank Sinatra? I asked jokingly. Mr. Stern says that someday we will play it, but not here. It isn't on the program. Sitting in a box with my parents, I realized how important this concert was, especially for my mother. The family legacy would continue. Andy might not be playing the Frank Sinatra, but he was assuming the family mantle. It was a huge responsibility, but he seemed up to it. When the works on the printed program ended, it was time for encores. Stern announced the second encore. We have had a special request. We will be playing the finale from Cesar Frank's Violin Sonata. And what they played, my favorite movement in the entire violin and piano repertoire. Going backstage afterward, I could not wait to ask Andy, who requested the Frank? He grinned and said, I did. <laughs> and the family tradition continued. Amazing, amazing, with the start of a sonata in 1853. And I told you it does come all the way 18 to 16, uh, to 1985. And I've run out of time, but the story at its end was that Andy did succeed in playing this brilliant sonata that his grandmother had performed across Europe and the United States and of Russia one more time, just days before he died. Uh, and that was in December of 1985. Um, 
it was a sad uh, passing. There is actually a tree uh, planted next to the opera house, which has a plaque there for him. Um, so the end of our tale, ending a little bit on a sad note, but incredible that the famous sonata was carried through this family for all these years and played finally here in Rockport in its final performance by the Lubeschutz family. Thank you very much for joining me. Sorry to have been jumping around the world and jumping around the years. I hope I tied it together enough to tell you the tale of the Nightingale Sonata written by Thomas Wolfe. It's a brilliant story and a great salute to a great musical family. I strongly suggest you read it all. Next week, we go to another great book we move off to London in 1915 and Somerset Mom's most famous book of human bondage. I hope you'll join us next week. Thanks for sticking, me, sticking with me in this long tale. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed reading the book. Have a great week and I hope to see you again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>